Welcome to lecture 12 in our series. Lecture 12 will be a series of lectures um, in which we're going to go through the case study of strain silicon. It's an unusual case in that we've had 20 years to track the development of this fundamental innovation and usually uh, fundamental innovations hop from one place to another and people change and we generally only record the last you know five years of a sequence. So um, uh, we will talk about strain silicon and the startup company Amberwave, which um, was used to transition the technology from uh, research to the marketplace. Before delving into the example of um, uh, strain silicon, it's important to understand kind of the main paradigm that's been driving a lot of the um, advancement over hundreds of years actually in, in, in mankind. And what I'm showing here is uh, uh, the year um, on the x-axis and a metric called calculations per second per thousand dollars. So basically how much it costs to do a calculation. And this is from uh, one of Kurzweil's um, extrapolations over the ages. Um, if you go to the MIT infinite corridor um, you'll see pictures of people that have worked in the mechanical logic and elect uh, electromechanical logic age, which was a big deal back then. Um, remember, this is a log axis, so you know things are actually improving quite rapidly here. Uh, then there was the uh, transistor era. Uh, the transistor discovery notice um, occurred um, 1949, uh, but if you look at the blue points here, you'll notice that um, there's a, a shift like uh, we talked about in the, um, in the fundamental technology section where uh, there's a delay of 10 to 15 years. And you can see that shift here because here's the invention of the transistor and then here's the, um, the blue points represent kind of the commercial penetration. Uh, so, um, you know, in a way what uh, Kurzweil mentions here is that there's been many paradigms. There's first the mechanical, then the electromechanical, then the vacuum tubes, then discrete transistors, and then integrated circuits. And so Moore's law is really just the um, the fifth paradigm up here uh, in which mankind is pursuing this. And that's why you can be pretty sure that you know this is going to continue. And it's interesting to see how systems are going to evolve and evolve, and how mankind is going to make new things up there. Uh, one of the things that we did to try to anticipate that was um, use uh, the discovery that we had of how to control and create high-quality lattice mismatch materials, which we'll explain in this lecture. That's the fundamental advance that eventually led to strain silicon. But just to finish with the kinds of inventions along this paradigm, uh, noise integrated circuit patents, which means that a little bit before that is when you actually have the invention or aha moment for integrated circuits and you can see that's here and again there's a 10 or 15 year delay before integrated circuits really start to, to show up in the commercial marketplace and then as we'll be talking about in this lecture around 1991 is when we really proved high mobility strain silicon but it was not uh, really incorporated until actually uh, 2004, which of course is another 15 year delay or something like that. So um, the, hopefully from this chart you can see that uh, the paradigm that's been driving a lot of these advances um, is to create uh, more calculations per second per thousand dollars. Uh, better known as Moore's Law, because what accom accompanies this is that the miniaturization, as we go further, um, things keep on getting smaller, and that's how this, this, this y-axis is able to hold up. And you can see the delays and the technologies that keep this going, and we're going to go into detail about the strain silicon discovery. I put discovery in quotes only because, as, as we've pointed out many times, uh, there's um, a lot of work that goes in beforehand, in this case, in lattice mismatch materials, which actually led to 
the discovery of strained silicon. So it's not really a, a, a single point in time. So um, to look at uh, the actual timeline uh, from what I was just talking about, uh, you can see here we have a timeline that we started as early as 1998 over at Bakshi. Uh, uh, this is before 1998 um, with uh, Cornell University. And then from 1998, uh, or you'll see in the chart in a second, this is actually the AT&T Bell Labs. So what happened was um, initially there was some work I'll talk about in a minute at Cornell University. And that led to um, going to at and Bell Laboratories where I was able to further develop that um, understanding and, and later what became a technology. And the kinds of things to show you that are evolving in this time through this iterative process is that, you know, we're looking in the very early days, and, and I'll talk about this briefly, about mismatched materials R&D, trying to figure out how can we put these materials together, what, what's limiting them. And this is kind of at those very early stages where we have big um, uncertainty, but in the technology area, we know kind of what a, key, a, a few key problems that we need to do research on because then we could iterate and converge on many applications. If there was many applications for these lattice mismatch materials, but we had to first figure out, uh, you know, what was possible in terms of performance and quality and things like that. And, and that led to several scientific problems. Uh, the first solution of all that in the, in the technical domain was leading to the uh, first high mobility strain silicon. And that's where um, at temperatures as low as 4 Kelvin, we were able to measure the, the um, highest mobility um, electrons uh, in silicon ever. And it, of course, it's a physics experiment because at 4 Kelvin, that's um, absolute zero is to equal zero, zero Kelvin, where uh, there's no atomic motion, which is impossible to, to reach. But um, at 4 Kelvin, um, you can see that we finally achieved a long-term goal. And, it, and to those of us in the know, it was like, wow, if we can repeat this at room temperature, then that could be significant impact on, on application. Uh, we built some research devices, but actually, um, as we'll talk about later, the difficulties of commercialization um, and um, sort of uh, needing to be around young and enthusiastic people I moved to the uh, to MIT in 1994 uh, to continue research on the key problems that after Bell Laboratories we knew were there. And these sort of fundamental problems, other fundamental problems needed to be worked on before we could really um, bring things to fruition. Uh, there, the kinds of key things we did there was uh, materials R&D and, and, and because of the, those fundamental problems that are kind of in the way of commercialization, we were able to get good intellectual property. We also started to understand process device R&D, the connection between the materials and building research devices in the, uh, in the university. As you'll see, we formed a company called Ambroid Systems. Uh, the first version of that company was an LLC in 1998 with the idea that actually it wasn't about strained silicon at the beginning, it was about lattice mismatched semiconductors, and there were several applications we were pursuing. Um, Singapore MIT Alliance uh, fed into this because um, my, I joined this new effort back in 1998 in order to have relationships and some sort of connection uh, deeper within Asia, and it turns out that that ended up helping us because we were able to find a partner there uh, during the uh, iteration to help build the first um, devices outside of the university, and that's why we created a small uh, part of Ambrowave inside Singapore, actually, which we called um, ASC for Ambrowave Systems Corporation, Corporation Asia. And then we used uh, that progress to then seed the technology uh, uh, with our partners. So um, most people don't remember this, but the first commercial material that could be fabricated into um, strained silicon devices 
uh, was done in an outsourced infrastructure, kind of the, the more foundry mode, the disaggregated infrastructure we're talking about, and that the first commercial transistors where a company, Amberwave, was making those was done. Um, so present day here, um, I believe, was probably around 2003, 2004, or something like that. Uh, this lecture is being recorded in 2013. So, um, I'd like to go through the strain silica example of a real innovation, a real fundamental innovation, which is harder to track. Uh, the technology's been in microprocessors now since 2004. It's enabled uh, Moore's Law, which is a shrinking of transistor density, the, the increase of transistor density every 18 to 24 months, depending on which part of time you're looking at. And um, for sure, it's delivered billions and billions of dollars to the marketplace, of course, and then probably much more than that because of the, you know, progressing above it in the supply chain, everything from... Uh, servers and internet and uh, Google above that allows the entire information age to keep on moving. So clearly there's repercussions for, you know, making higher transistor densities, improves performance. But in modern times, it also lowers costs and, and lowers power. And so the um, uh, it's a very important thing. Uh, and uh, uh, this is really an important part, and it kind of led to... Um, more detailed understanding of this innovation process that we're teaching in this class, which is that, um, you know, we are involved in this process for um, over 20 years. And so um, it gives insight into this iterative process that typically is obscured because, you know, as we've mentioned, uh, you know, you might start off with, you know, the three areas, market, technology, and implementation. And as they iterate, we've shown that um, if you're lucky uh, and this process is done well, you can end up on, a, on an innovation in the marketplace, uh, innovation which we define as an embodiment of idea in, in the marketplace. However, um, what we didn't talk much about was that, you know, for this to be in the same organization over 20 years is kind of rare because as you go through this process to the final convergence, uh, it is unlikely that the organization you're in can have all these different objectives over this whole whole time frame. So indeed, um, you know, in our case, we moved, uh, as you saw from the last thing, from university at Cornell initially to industry at 18, back to a university, to a startup, and then um, finally into major semiconductor manufacturers like Intel. So uh, that process uh, if the same people don't go with it each time, you can imagine that at various points you have, you know, different financing, and you could have different people. And so in general, you know, these windows in time are typically five years at the most, like most investors or most people will probably only work on things five years uh, for, um, you know, this, this, what we talked about before, incremental innovation. Uh, is is sort of um, uh, well within the standard financing and probability that that humans can deal with, and so um, you know usually if there's an advance that finally enters the marketplace, you uh, look back five years and, see, and you see where it came from. But the pillars that it was founded on in this process we've talked about, you have to actually reach back, and it's very difficult when the the financing and the people um, change over time. So this is an unusual example in that uh, we've been there the whole time, and so we can um, show how uh, it evolved. Now, in this lecture, we are going through a different um, sort of uh, um, additional information compared to the book. Um, if you look at the book Inside Real Innovation, this is the main example in Chapter 5. And we cycle back and talk about how market implementation and technology are narrowing over time. Here, this is probably a more abbreviated and also different view. So um, after you see this, the Chapter 5, uh, with Chapter 5 and Inside Real Innovation, uh, should give you a pretty good perspective on how, how this worked in the, in the real world, even though a linear picture 
would just show um, you know research and strain silicon, high mobility, formation of a company, and then finally uh, licensing it and getting into the um, to marketplace. So uh, we'll stop there, and in the next thing we'll start our story with uh, Cornell University, where uh, the foundation for the initial work and direction, uh, especially for myself, uh, was started. Mm -hmm.